Today is March 7th, 1996. We are here in Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. The death penalty is a political creation. It is a creation of the state and a creation by politicians to obtain political power and higher office. That politicians use the death penalty as a stepping stone for higher political office and that they project using people's cases um, what people are about on death row and that's deceitful it's untrue it's unreal in this sense that you will hear politicians talk about people on death row are the worst of the worst and they're this and they're that and they're monsters and so forth but what you will not hear is that there are many people serving lesser sentences, life sentences, or a term of years, who have been convicted of similar, if not the same kinds of things. Or there are other people who are, by virtue of their wealth, were not convicted at all. So what we're really talking about is a system that calls itself a justice system, that uses the injustice of wealth, power, rank, status, race, privilege, to determine who comes on death row. You see, why is it that 9% of this state's population is close to 70% or 75% of death row's population? And I speak here of African Americans. And that's because, you know, the city of Philadelphia, um, like the city of Houston, like the city of Miami and Dade County, are cities where politicians have built their careers on sending people on death row. They're not making people any safer, you see. They're not uh, 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 showing people by their example justice. What they're showing is the partiality of injustice. Because for most of the people on death row, the overwhelming majority of people on, on death row were poor, could not afford uh, the resources to develop a defense, could not begin to combat the forces of the state, the government. Uh, and as we saw very recently, that is, all of us across America, if not around the world, in the O.J. Simpson case in California, well, the kind of defense you get is the kind of defense you can afford. Most of the people who are here on death row in Pennsylvania, in New Jersey, in Florida, in Texas, in Illinois, in California, are on death row because they could not afford what O.J. Simpson could afford, which is the best defense. Could you once again say a word what you feel about violence? Is violence needed or do you believe in a different way? I believe that violence violates the self. Um, that <laughs> what the system believes in, what the system practices, and what the system uh, preaches is violence. And what the one thing that we don't want to do is do the same thing that the system is doing every day. If that were the case, why replace the system, you see? We want a new system where people are free and free of the violence of the system. Um, we would hope for a day when there are no bombs, whether of any kind, you know, thermonuclear or conventional so-called, no guns, uh, no weapons, no prisons, no poverty, because all of these things are tools and weapons of violence. Um, and we reject that. Now, Momia, what do you feel are several of the most serious problems confronting the children of our present-day society, and what effects could these problems have in the future? Well, I think, just as Kozel demonstrated in his book, Amazing Grace, um, the most positive thing that all children have innate within them is hope. Um, those children living in the worst possible conditions in the world, in poverty, um, in slums, uh, surrounded by drugs and so forth, still have an innate hope 
So that's the positive part of it. Um, the negative part in terms of the problems that they face, and more directly to your question, is that they are, for the most part, ignored and opposed by the social order, by the system. Um, I remember what probably touched my heart was reading about the little boy, uh, David, who talked about how he looked at TV and he saw the mayor of New York City and he said, I don't like him. And Kazo says, well, why, why do you say that? He says, because when I look in his eyes, all I see is coldness. And he doesn't understand how poor people have to live. That is the way that most politicians and most people who are wealthy in this system look at those children. They see coldness, they sense that coldness from these people who literally control their circumstances, whether they live or die, you know, the conditions of the neighborhood, uh, uh, the state of their education, all of the very important variables. So those are very serious problems. In terms of hope, I think children are born in hope. Children are our only hope for the future, a future. Children are the future. It's like Khalil Gibran says, they are not um, of us, even though they come from us, that they are like arrows that we shoot towards infinity, you know, and where they go, we cannot see. Children are tomorrow. They are hope. They are um, the closest human beings can come to immortality because they come from immortality and they carry every hope with them from us to a future that we can't see. I think in terms of the best thing for them is to nurture that hope, to give them reasons to hope and to, um, to feed that hope so that it grows into something stronger and that sustains them through their life. And the highest form of love is to pay attention to them. It's almost like uh, Elie Wiesel says, the greatest hatred is not the anger of hatred, but the indifference of hatred. And the opposite of that, the greatest love is the attention that we can pay to our, to our young people, our children. Now, I believe, Momia, that you have read the manuscript of my book, Leading Your Child to God. I have read your book. I have read the full manuscript, every word. And I agree that it does have very, very significant value to children of the world. Because children come fresh, directly from the divine source from what we call mama, from life itself, from the God of all creation. That's why none of us, I don't care what our race, creed, religion, politics are, none of us can look at a child and not feel joy. And that's every child on the planet. We look at them and it just something thrills us, you know, in the, in the, in the basis of our heart. They are living miracles. And, you know, when we look at them, we know that there is a God, that all is possible, that life itself is a miracle, you know. Um, there is no father that looks at his child and doesn't feel awe at the source that brings this creation, you know, through mother, through life. Because children are the fruits of our love of human love and divine love. And they show us with their innocence, with their clarity, the very face of God in human form, you know. So in that very sense, I find a lot of good and value and positive information in your book. Can my book, A Plea for Purity, be of assistance and help 
to concern troubled and struggling parents? I think so. And I think so in this sense that what your book, A Plea for Purity, does very clearly is it praises the concept of marriage. I mean, um, it embraces it in a way that is not really embraced. I mean, when you hear these politicians talk, it's kind of cold, distant, lifeless. I mean, you sense, just like that little boy David did when he looked at TV and saw this politician, you sense not caring, not affection, not love, but coldness, you know, because politics is a cold art. They don't care about people, they care about power. I don't sense that in your book. I sense a deep caring about people wanting to put together what is fundamental in life, a loving, caring family. Um, a loving, caring marriage, and a loving, caring community. I mean, isn't that really what we all want in, you know, in this world, in life? That's the foundation. Mumia, it would be wonderful if you could say a few words um, how our country needs to rediscover what family means and also expand a bit. In the last decades, the primary responsibility for educating children has shifted from the family to the school. What is your input on that? Well, I would say that when you look at education, generally in this country and perhaps around the world, but specifically in this country, what you'll see is from the very earliest years when a child goes to school and comes back home, the child perceives mom and dad differently than he did before he went to school. He senses that parents, his parents, are somehow not as smart as his teacher. And that means stupid, um, unintelligent, ignorant, uninformed. He gets that sense that when he needs to learn something, he goes to his teacher. He doesn't go to his mother. He doesn't go to his father. Because his teacher knows his parents don't. I think that at that point, what you develop is a kind of alienization or an alienation of the child from his family unit, his fundamental family unit, mom and pop. And while educators will talk about the school experience as socialization, and this is a good thing, I think what you're really looking at is desocialization because he is alienated and desocialized from his family unit and put into a secondary unit that he looks at as of worth, of value. And he begins to rank. Well, the teacher knows such and such and such. Well, the parents don't know. You see what I'm saying? And so that family as a unit suffers, you see. I do think that um, this is precisely because the social order has developed, I'm talking about the social economic order has developed in such a way that in America and perhaps in other you know, industrialized societies in this world, in order for a family to make enough material resources and money to support the family. Well, you have to have the father working and the mother working. You need two income family. We do what we're taught to do in this social order. And a lot of what we do is not necessarily good for us. It's just customary and traditional. And, you know, um, we need to develop the community that can truly educate the children without alienating them from their parents, you know. Who, 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 you know, brought them into this creation, you know. Now, one, one of my topics in the book, Leading Your Child to God, is about the movement of homeschooling, which is rapidly growing in our country. Sure. Now, do you see this as a positive movement or a negative or a mixture of both? 
what, what do you know about homeschooling? Well, I've read some things about it, and my family, the MOVE organization, has been involved with it, you know. So I look at it with both positives and some negatives. Um, there are some people who utilize this um, for, frankly, very racist reasons to try to exclude children from contact with other cultures, other people. But fundamentally, I think, it is a positive thing, you see. I mean, um, because for the same reasons I said about how a child tends to look at his parents or her parents after he leaves the home and enters that school situation. I think it can be positive if people look at it consciously and um, work towards those ends. Uh, but I think it's fundamentally positive. It can be negative, and it depends on the family that, you know, and the reasons why they do that. To me, um, I agree with you, but to me the most negative thing is that a child is stopped from relating to his peers if he is schooled at home and uh, children need to re learn with other children their age. Well, yeah, I think also that it should be noted that the Bruderhof, your family, your community, you have your own, you know, primary schools. So, because you have your own schools, you're conscious of who teaches and what is taught and how it's taught and in what spirit that happens, you see. Many people who live in the city have nothing even remotely close to that, you see. Um, in fact, they have no idea what is being taught. Um, they have no idea who the teacher really is. They don't know who that person is. So I think that the, the experience that the Bruderhof have is very different from the average person in the city or even in a rural setting where they don't know who those persons is. They don't know who that teacher is. They don't know what's being taught. They don't know the spirit. And they don't know how that person really relates to that child, you see. You know, you hear it very often when you read the papers or you look at TV about how parents in general society are just so glad when summer is over because when summer is over they can take that kid and put them back in school and their day is kind of free again. You see what I'm saying? So, In that sense, um, the Hoffs have an advantage that a lot of people don't have. During the past year, the Bruderhof communities have become deeply involved in your case and in the lives of the MOVE members and in the death penalty question in general. Would you have a message to relay to the brothers, sisters, and children of the Bruderhof? First of all, of course, a heartfelt thank you to every member of the Bruderhof, from the smallest, the youngest, to the oldest, the eldest, um, here in America and abroad, in England and all around the world. We are very, very grateful uh, that the Bruderhof uh, came to our attention for existing and making just human contact between people. A week ago, we had a class from Columbia University, the journalism class in religion, count us, there were about 30 students. We had a communal meal time and the children sang, and then they asked questions. That's the second time they have come. You know, Ari Goldman used to be the religion editor of the New York Times. Now he teaches journalism at Columbia University. And he wants to make it a yearly thing to have his students come and experience community. That's great. I think it could be quite helpful for the future. What do you think? I think it could be helpful not so much for the community, but for those journalists. Because journalists tend to be, you know, dyed in the wool, cynical. Um, they believe in, you know, the worst of people, not the best of people. Um, they believe in the negative, not the positive. They really do. 
And when you think about middle of the road journalism in America, mainstream journalism, very rarely does spiritual matters or religious matters or even deep social issues really penetrate to the core of that science or that craft of journalism because it's kind of, it's corny from a journalistic perspective. And I think that any thinking, sensitive human being who sees and hears this out of the mouth of babes from children cannot help but be touched in their heart by that. You see. I, I think they were touched. I mean, sad to say, you tell me if you disagree. Uh, to me, the mainline media has been bought up by large corporations and through that it's also being highly censored. Uh, that's my impression of the mainline media today. Of course, to everything there are also exceptions. That's exactly, I believe you're absolutely true. And I, to give you some examples, if I may, very, when I was down in Philadelphia at my um, petition hearing, I was being brought back to the prison and the sheriffs had turned the radio on. I was listening to the news and the newscaster said, this just then, this bulletin, um, ABC, American Broadcasting Corporation, has just been acquired by Disney Corporation. And I laughed. And I was in the back and I was just laughing. I said, well, I guess we're going to have Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck on the news tonight, right? But that's just one out of many, you know. We used to talk about almost the same way I said earlier about politicians. We used to talk about the media being in the hip pocket of big business and being controlled by big business. Well, today, the major media are big business. They are part of these multinational huge corporations. And if you think they don't control what comes into that camera lens and out on that TV screen, well, come on. If I own you, I control you. If I pay you, I tell you what to say and what not to say. And when you look at the news today, I'm talking now about a national network newscast. The similarities between, think about this, Christoph, the similarities between a national network newscast and what used to be a local newscast are astounding. Local crime stories become national news stories not because of anything extraordinary about that, but that's the stuff that they're feeding out there. They don't feed pieces that talk about the fundamental relationships of power and rank and status in this country. They talk about sensation, you know. It's almost as if the average newscast is produced by hard copy or one of these other you know, shows like that. Just, it's trash. But it's trash that's this, this designed to attract you emotionally, to touch you sensationally, to get you looking, but not to get you thinking. Not to question the fundamental relationships of power, of wealth, of justice, of injustice. Those issues, they don't apply, you see. They do not question the relationship and the rightness of power. They take that for granted, you see. And when you ally that and you put that in concert with the political machinery that's in place today, I'm talking about the right wing um, shift in American politics. Well, you have a dangerous and a deadly and a malevolent concoction. That's what you have, that's what you have. You know, you have a guy who can run for president and be best friends with, you know, a Klansman and, you know, have Klansmen and uh, uh, Aryan Nation brethren on his staff. And, oh, well, that's not important. Uh, I don't know. We're not, you know. And they can brush it off and he goes on and he goes on. Just like in the um, 30s and 40s in Germany, when you know, obviously, intimately, much better than I, 
when you talk about the Nazi experience, when you talk about the Hitler phenomena in Germany, you could not have that kind of political explosion of Nazi um, organization without the undercover but significant support of people of means, of finances, the Krupps and so forth, the Fords here in America. They were supported by people of wealth. They just didn't spring out of the, you know, one day they were here and one day they weren't. They were supported by financial interest because in the last analysis, they protected their interest. You know, when you read books that talk about um, how this government, through its CIA and its FBI, supported and paid and protected mafia hitmen and stuff like that so that they could knock off and destroy socialists and communists. That's not just by coincidence because they knew that would protect the interests of the wealthy. Fundamentally what we're talking about is how um, the U.S. government has allied itself with some of the darkest forces in history for economic gain, for economic interest, to protect the status quo um, and continue to do so, you know, continue to do so. None of this stuff that's happening in America is in a vacuum. When you have um, David Dukes running for governors or Buchanan running for president and uh, Klansmen on his staff and, you know, everybody talking about um, well, it's okay to forget the poor. Uh, what we need is more executions. Uh, poor people are, have it too good in this country. Uh, what we need to do is start uh, 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 chopping people's heads off. I mean, the kind of, the level, the political level of discourse is anti-life. It's death-centered. And that's not by um, coincidence. I have probably a good chance to speak to many college campuses this year about these two books. And my message to the young people is, one life can make a difference. Would you have a message to the American young people how they can make our country a better nation? Yes, Christophe. I would say, first of all, that children and young people who are not children, but young adults who are college students should recognize that at this exact point in life, this is the freest they'll ever be in their life. However they want to look at that. I mean, because marriage imposes obligations, um, one's career and job imposes obligations. When they're at a point in life where they're able to study, to learn, to grow in the life of the mind. They're free. They're at a level of freedom that they cannot and will not probably experience for decades. So they should take this opportunity to feed their minds, you know, not just with information, but with, you know, information that feeds the spirit and the deeper inner self. I would invite them to read your books. I would invite them to read my books as well. And to ask themselves questions you know, about what they see there. And because they are at this freedom phase of their lives, to not underestimate the worth and wealth of that phase. Because now, at this time, when they're free, is the time when they can move to change the world. You know, worlds are changed in people's minds, in their perception. And this is the time for them to do that, the proper time, you know. The fastest what, what is your message to your supporters? What is your answer to uh, this, this problem, this crisis? How can people keep together the, the, the potential for a movement that your case is at the center of? And move, move 
Muslim's founder, John Africa, teaches that when you're committed to doing that which is right, the power of righteousness will never betray you. That is your standard by which you do all that you do. You say, is it right? And if it's right, you go forward, no matter what the opposition, no matter what walls stand before you. That has been my personal motivating force. Um, I think that some young people are um, touched by the revelation that when I was their age, when I was 14, 15, 16, I was involved in a movement that they now know no longer exists. And I know that not just based on what I read or what I felt or what others have reported to me. I know that intimately, personally, because I've met young guys coming to death row. And I mean, about as apolitical as a lemon. Come up to me and say, ah, yo, hey, oh, hey. I'm like, man, who are they talking to? You know, hey, Grandpa, uh, my mother, my grandmama told me about Black Panther. You know, what's up with that? You know, and I met people whose parents were in the Black Panther Party, and they tried to talk to their children when they were out on the street, but they didn't listen. Now they come here, they're on death row, and they're finding out about it. I give them a book or talk to them, or, you know what I mean? Send them some information. And I think that that same thing happens because right now, not just in Africa, America, but in America, period, the young people in America are in an extreme state of alienation. They are, for all intents and purposes, the enemy of the state. They don't see any future for them other than working for McDonald's, flipping burgers, you know, uh, you know, working at the video store. I mean, come on. There is no, there is no promise for them. Unlike even our generation when we were kids, where they were, for all intents and purposes, endless promises. I know what you mean. Even unfulfilled, but endless promises. I mean, I remember when I was a young man, you know, I got fired from quite a few jobs for running my mouth and talking about stuff that I wasn't supposed to talk about, but I never had a problem getting a job. Well, a young man my age, that was uh, my age now, would have that problem with that first job. It's a, the economy has been transformed. So in the face of that alienation, you see, they look back and they see the history of a party like the Black Panther Party. And they're attracted to that militant standard and example because they don't see it presently. They can see ex-Panthers, some of them. They can't see Geronimo because he's been in that hell hole in California for so many years. They can't see Dr. Mutulu Shakur because he's been in that hell hole in California for so many years. But more importantly, they don't see that continuing reality. And they do not hear a voice that speaks truth to power, that talks about their oppressed, repressed, dogged reality. And I try to do that in some ways. And I think that because they hear from this old man someone who speaks the truth about what they're looking at, they hear, they respond, and they come. And they know, based on their reality right there, they know it ain't easy for them, and they know it ain't easy for me. But they know it's right, you see. And although the, that, when they hear about this 14, 15 year old kid who's a Black Panther, and that opens the door to the MOVE organization, and they find out the kind of unholy repression that has been visited on the MOVE organization. You know, August 8th confrontation, the May 13th mass murder and massacre. Well, they find out something that they didn't read about in their history books, you know, that they didn't learn in so-called black study class. And they find a new reality about what it means to be an African-American in America speaking one's truth to power, you see. They don't hear it from their politicians because their politicians are too busy trying to sound like the next conservative next door. 
you see? You have, you know, in this country, in this culture, you know, we have uh, elected black people into positions of prominence and power. But those black people don't exercise any power, not to the interests of, the, of those people, you know? They know that they may have a black mayor in their city, but that don't stop the policemen from kicking them in their ass, from beating them down. You know, I just read recently the Amsterdam news about your city, New York, the police stopping kids, 14, 15, 16, and putting them in a lineup. At first they offer them 15, 20, hey kid, you want some money? If the kid says no, well come on anyway. What's this, new age slavery? You can put a child in a lineup and if this kid gets picked, his whole life is transformed in a moment? Does he have a choice? Is he a free being? And they know in their heart of hearts, if they don't have the freedom to walk down the street, well, damn it, what kind of freedom do they have? And all they hear in class is about, oh, Martin Luther King, he fought and he died for us, and he's a great leader. And they say, I ain't trying to hear that shit. You know? A recent book was written, uh, and this is why that thought came to my mind about Martin King. And it's called Amazing Grace. And it talks about a hellish neighborhood, Mott Haven in the Bronx. I know the Bronx. I mm -hmm. worked in the Bronx when I was working with the Ministry of Information of the Black Panther Party. I was selling papers in the Bronx. And got frozen out there at 2 o'clock in the morning, going in the bar selling that Panther paper. But he talked about a bitter, vicious, um, genocidal reality in Mott Haven. And when he talked to these seven, eight, nine-year-old, and he, of course, is uh, Jonathan Kozel, who wrote the book. When he talked to six, seven, eight, nine, ten-year-old kids, they said they felt that the people downtown, the rich people, the bankers, the stockbrokers, he said, they don't hate us so much. They just wish we were never born. These are kids. <laughs> and they feel that in their heart of hearts. You know? And when they have those politicians out there talking about, well, all you need to do is go to school and just say no, and they ain't trying to hear that. They know this thing is wrong. They know it in their guts. They know it in their souls. And if they know it's wrong, if you can't say it, then damn it, don't say nothing to them. You know? So, I think in many respects, um, when I write about them, I write about them with the love of a father, you know? And uh, someone who cares because I, Unlike a lot of people our age, I, I don't forget when I was a kid. It was a glorious time to be alive in the 60s, young, 14, 15, 16. Uh, many of my contemporaries were in gangs, fighting each other for a turf in the neighborhood and we didn't own a damn brick. And I mean fighting wars. But when it came to fighting a sister, oh, no, I'm not gonna do that. Well, damn, what? what's the diff, guys? What's, what's up? So there, you know, because ultimately because we failed, because we did not prevail, their life is so dire and so bitter today, you know. Um, had we prevailed, their life would have been a better life today. Their life would not be as hellish as it is today. So to take another question that you, you know, posed about where does this movement go from here, God knows. You know, I'm fighting every day, not just for my freedom, not just for my liberation, but for all of our liberation. I'm unabashedly, I fight for revolution because I think revolution is the only solution. I'm not shy about using that word. Um, am I conscious about what I say? I am more conscious about what I say. I can't help but be. I'll be faking it. Oh no, I say the same. No, I think about it because I don't want a young person, or even an old person, to be misled, you know, because it's dangerous out there. 
But I know this, that in the old days, you know, Dr. Huey Newton said, the spirit of the people is more powerful than the man's technology. And when people recognize their power, the power to say no, the power to say enough, the power to say, well, damn it, let's get together and change this thing, then anything is possible. You know? If that message gets out there to kids, to young adults thinking about their tomorrow, then it don't matter what they do to me, they ain't stop me. Because revolution is my religion. coming together to totally transform this horrific reality. And if they don't, well, ain't nothing gonna change. It's gonna get worse and worse and worse. We're living in an age where, and not just in the United States, you know, sometimes we think too parochially. You know, we think about New York, even though that's a, you know, a massive, humongous state, or we think about Pennsylvania, another huge, you know, and sometimes we think about the United States. But what's happening now is a global thing. It is international. You know, when we talk about corporations going across the Mexican border and setting up the maquiladores down in the, on the other side of the Rio Grande or sisters in Indonesia sewing up Reeboks for 23 cents a week, a day or something like that. We're talking about a world reality, not a national reality. And um, very recently, there was a bit of controversy in the United States about a crime bill. Most people didn't know that same controversy was happening over in Britain called the Criminal Justice Act. It was almost the same thing. It had almost all of the same elements. And central and key to that element was repression, repression, more prisons, locking people down, treating juveniles as if they're adults, uh, bringing back the, I mean, all of the most repressive elements. That's not coincidence, you know? It didn't just happen because, oh, well, you know, this is a good year to do that. It happened because the ruling class interest in this world through the G7, through GATT, through NAFTA, and all of these agreements, understand that the lion's share of capital and wealth must go to them, and the crumbs can't even fall to the many. And because people are getting less of the resources that they need to survive, well, naturally, what's gonna happen is people are gonna rebel. Now, they're trying to turn that around into, well, it's the niggers who got what you want. I mean, what do black people have in this country in abundance except misery? Are we a majority of death row? Well, yeah, you want some of this? We a majority of prison, do you wanna take that back? We have a majority of people in ghettos. Do we have enough of that? You know. But that's how the ruling class, through the media, which is itself, I mean, we used to talk about the media as being a tool of big business. Well, look at the media today. It is big business. You know, Disney just bought ABC, didn't it? You see. What does that tell you? It's a multi-billion dollar conglomerate like any other. Uh, conglomerate and their interests are corporate and conglomerate and who pays that check decides what gets said it's as real as that and how it gets said or if it gets said at all you see so that's the that's the focus you know, you know people must unite for their common interests you know against the most repressive government of this age, you know, and criticize their grandparents and parents for not doing the work that should have been done in the 60s and in the 70s, you know, because if, if we had done the work that should have been done, their reality would be much better than it is now. You talk about the need for a revolution, you know, in this country and for most of the world, really, and 
Um, so what is your view in terms of what the revolution would be fighting for? Is it to reform capitalism in a more radical way? Or is it to really just have a new system? It must be a new system, or the abolition of this system. It must be, because, you know, people who study economics will tell you that there's such a thing as a business cycle. There is. You know, there are boom times, there are depressions. There are boom times, there are depressions. There are boom times, there are recessions, and then there's depressions. Right now, we're in an area where there's depression for workers, but a boom time for capital, for those with wealth, for those who own stock and mutual funds and so forth. There's enough wealth you know, in this country to ensure that every child is educated, truly educated, with, with life education. There's enough wealth in this country alone to make sure that no one has to live in a shack, in a hovel, in a ghetto. You know, there's enough wealth so that every person can be properly you know, housed and fed and have faith in a future. But when you have people who have it all, you're gonna have someone who has nothing. You know, I'm going back to what John Consul said in his book. He talked to people in downtown New York on the stock exchange, people that he knew that were his contemporaries. He talked about one man that made one billion dollars profit in one year. And he said this one man with his wins of one year could feed, clothe, and educate that whole neighborhood that he was reviewing in Amazing Grace. The whole neighborhood. The children could go to college, the kids could you know, have a future. But that, that calls for a transformation that is nothing short of revolutionary, you see. Because there are many revolutions, because there are many phases and facets in human uh, society, you know. And true revolution impacts all of those phases, all of those segments of society. And um, it must come in all of those phases and segments of society. Um, either that or, you know, if you think things are bad now, just wait a while. Is there anything that we haven't touched on that uh, yeah, and that's prison life. Oh. Um, there is a common mythology about prisons that suggests that, you know, these are country clubs. The politicians would have you believe that. Of course, nobody's rushing to come in here. You know? um, imagine, if you will, doing life in your bedroom, and I mean 22 hours, 22 or 23 hours as is here now, a day, and another hour in a cage, you know. Um, I invite any um, broadcaster, yourselves included, to tour, not the, just the visiting facilities, but to tour cells, to tour cages, and to look at it from that perspective, you know. Um, there are different kinds of prisons in different states and different systems. There are some that are, of course, worse than others. There are some that are better than others. But all prisons are prisons and are by their very nature hell holes, you see. And when you talk about the reality of death row, where someone is serving not a sentence, but uh, a timeless sentence until their death, and you talk about a special kind of hell, a special kind of hell that is reserved for some people and off limits for others. I don't know if it made news for you up there in New York, but right here around uh, southeastern Pennsylvania, not far from Philadelphia, they had a very big case with a man named John E. DuPont. Oh, good. Yeah. Here's a guy that you know has about 
500 million dollars pocket money. This is his money, not talking about the family money or the corporate, you know, trusts. He was recently charged with killing an Olympic uh, athlete, a wrestler. Um, he was charged with shooting the man and then shooting him again once the man fell. He did this, I am informed by published reports, so we're not sure about that, but he did this in front of the man's wife and the man's children. Recently, the district attorney for his county, I think it's Bucks County or Delaware County, announced they would not be seeking the death penalty for Mr. DuPont because they couldn't find an aggravating circumstance in this. If this were any other case, let us suggest, for the sake of argument, that the killed athlete, Mr. Schultz, Schultz, I think his name was, or something. What do you think would be happening to Mr. Schultz now if, if he had an argument with Mr. DuPont and he shot and killed Mr. DuPont? Do you think the DA would have found an aggravating circumstance? In fact, in Pennsylvania, there is an aggravating stance called grave risk of death to another. I know about the aggravating circumstance, not because I read in the law books, but because the district attorney in Philadelphia charged me with that aggravating circumstance, saying that uh, I created a grave risk of death to my brother at the scene. They found that, you see, even though the jury didn't return with it. My point to you is, if this man had not been a multi-millionaire, one of the wealthiest families, not in America, but on the planet Earth. Had he been, uh, not John DuPont, but John De Rivera, or John Jackson, <laughs> would he be on death row? And what does that say about the purposes and the exclusions of the death penalty in America? You see. So, uh, I ask that question, you know, your viewers can make their own determinations and answers. So in prison, um, uh, they're making all so they're forcing prisoners to make all sorts of things now. Uh, the, the stereotype, which was never true, I think, uh, but uh, you know, what most people think is that prisoners are making license plates or maybe breaking bricks. Which they, which they brought that back in several states now. But you have prisoners uh, making car parts. You have prisoners making uh, sophisticated, you know, products. You have, uh, you, if, if you go to New Mexico and you uh, fly into the airport and you dial for information in hotels, you'll have someone from the state penitentiary answering to tell you where the budget tell in is, you know. Uh, and uh, I know that in a number of states, there's a growing movement to, uh, number one, demand that at the very least, the prisoners be paid federal minimum wage. Uh, and I, I may not be uh, right on this, but I think I heard that someplace they actually won that, maybe in California. But there's a struggle, there was a struggle going on in Oak Park, Minnesota, okay. of prisoners mm. who were fighting for the minimum wage. Right. Mm. So. Uh, and also, along with that, you know, the talk of, you know, prisoners organizing themselves as mm -hmm. unions, you know, mm -hmm. because they are being exploited, right. you know, and clearly the factories, uh, you know, the ones that are shutting down, they're being moved to other countries, but they're also being moved inside these. You know, so, you know, what do you think about that? You know, the well, the U.S. Supreme Court, this was years ago, maybe 20, 25, 30 years ago, ruled in a case, I think it was called Jones versus Prisoners Union, that it is illegal for a prisoner to unionize. So by so doing, of course, they set the stage for precisely that movement that you're speaking of. There is a movement among U.S. capital to exploit prisoners for their own uh, interests, for their own wealth. I mean, here you have a captive work. Mm -hmm. um, captive work. Army. Um, in 
fact, there are several people, several justices of the Supreme Court that have spoken, that is not through their opinions, but publicly, you know, to civic groups and so forth, precisely along that line. That is coming. There is a bill right now pending in the Pennsylvania uh, General Assembly that would create, you see, uh, uh, prison corporate relationships, jobs. For years, for the last 50 or 60 years, American labor and American unions were strong enough to forestall that. They fought against it because they didn't want competition from people who were being paid, you know, two dollars a week or something like that. Because they didn't they could not, you know, fight that. Unions have been so defanged and so weakened in America that the other side of the pendulum is swinging now. That's happening in state after state after state. It will come to New York. It will come to Pennsylvania. And there's not much that can be done about it. Um, someone who doesn't want to work gets thrown into the hole. I mean, talk about union breaking and un uh, strike breaking tactics. You've got one built in right here. So, you know, what must be transformed is um, public consciousness outside because that is the, the only lever that can impact on that. And it must be consciousness that people can understand that, hey, it ain't in your best interest to open that door because the job you're doing today, I don't care if you're a receptionist or you answer 1-800-BEST-WESTERN, which some prison in Wyoming is doing right now. Uh, I don't care what job you'll do. With certain ramifications, it can be done cheaper in prison. So if you want to protect your job, 